Yeah, it's the people's sport. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> I'm chilly. It's funny. Yeah. It's I guess because I'm nervous. I don't know. That's I could feel that. Yeah. You're nervous. Yeah. Me too. Really nervous. I'm really high energy. I feel like I'm talking about you. Me too. Just ask us lots of questions. That's better than having to talk for a long time. That's why I volunteered to be moderator. Yeah. I had to give a presentation to like 20 funders last week, and I just like choked in the middle. It was so. It was like humiliating. I was like. Uh, <laughs> no, just like mentally, it was like, oh, I don't know. I hope they too. Yeah. It's like blank and nothing yes, you can yes, do. Yes, yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the crew that just won the biggest tax on corporations. Oh, you'll have to talk about um, yes. Including Amazon, oh. so we gotta celebrate them. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I think I they missed that win. Yeah. Well, Murphy tried to take away this corporate business tax, and then we got it reinstated called the corporate transit fee. Uh, it's a tax on all profits over $10 million oh. in New Jersey. It's the biggest corporate tax. All right. Cheese! Oh, I'm just listening to that. Like <laughs> <laughs> Got it? <laughs> Amy's taking one. Hey, Amy! <laughs> we quick, we quick. We quick. Just we say quick. We, yeah. We quick, man. <laughs> we quick. You quick. We not slow, we quick. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's where they receive, like, the planes arrive and they receive like packages, packages and then they get yeah. distributed out to the warehouses. Yeah, and there's a few. There's um, Kentucky, San Bernardino. Um, where else? Yeah. It's one of those things where I'm like, I probably should have been staggering the ending process, but I'm not that one's not in. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shirley. I work here at the People's Forum. Uh, I wanted to give a big welcome to everyone that has gathered here tonight. Um, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a political education and cultural event space. We host lots of things from uh, book talks, art workshops, film screenings. Um, and yeah, so some book talks like we have here tonight. Um, in addition to these events, we also have our own bookstore, 1804 Books. Uh, we use to distribute and publish stories on theory on international working class struggles. Um, so welcome everyone. And without making you all wait any longer, I'll pass it on to Jay Pabaru of the New Press uh, to tell you all a little bit about our book tonight, Power Lines, and to intro some of the panelists. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you to the People's Forum for having uh, power lines and uh, all of y'all and all of our panelists today. Um, yeah, the, the People's Forum has a big screen printing studio downstairs uh, and, some, and a, a movie theater. And so if you're excited by being in this space today, I, I definitely encourage y'all to talk with the folks who run the space and look into uh, how it might be a resource uh, in the future as well. Um, so I'm here with the New Press, uh, which is the publisher that published Power Lines, um, which is a, an anthology of stories from frontline communities and uh, labor, labor movement organizations um, who are 
in almost every case, thinking through how the climate struggles and uh, labor struggles are, are intertwined. And so each chapter in, in Power Lines tells the story of, of a vision for how strength in the labor movement uh, can lead to and is, is the, the fulcrum of, uh, of power that we have to push for real lasting climate solutions and solutions for our communities and for each other as workers. Um, so yeah, super glad to introduce Power Lines and our panelists tonight um, who have joined us uh, from, from near and far. Um, so first, uh, here we have Lindsay Zafir, who is going to be our moderator tonight. Um, Lindsay is one of the editors of Power Lines. Uh, Lindsay is a distinguished lecturer at City College of New York and the academic director of Leadership for Democracy and Social Justice. She is the former editor of The Forge, Organizing Strategy and Practice, the co-author with Jeff Orr Dower, who will introduce. Um, Lindsay lives right here in New York City. Um, I'll also introduce our fellow editor, um, Jeff Orr Dower. Jeff is the North America director of 350.org. Prior to joining 350, he was a co-founder of the Green Workers Alliance. Um, so welcome, Lindsay and Jeff, our two editors. And our, our other panelists here tonight are contributors to Power Lines. Um, they wrote up a, a history of a struggle that uh, many in the audience might be acquainted with. Um, so super excited to have people in the room who, who pushed for the struggle that is documented in this book. Um, so I'll first in introduce Winifred Victor Hines. Um, Winifred Victor Hines, born in Haiti, has extensive experience with with working with public grassroots organizations and businesses in the US and Latin America. She is currently the executive director of the We Quick Park Association and Olmsted Park, Park Conservancy in Newark, New Jersey, where she resides. She serves as a trustee on several boards, such as Clean Water Action, NJ and National, the New Jersey Highlands Coalition, Mary Noel Lay Volunteers, and La Fondacion uh, Alfred Bayard. Close. Um, she was appointed to the City of Newark Environmental Commission in 2015 and continues to serve as an environmental commissioner. As, an, as a community, community advocate, she is very involved with environmental justice and social justice issues, not only in Newark, but throughout New Jersey and nationally. And finally, um, we have Sarah Cullinane, um, who is from Make the Road, New Jersey. <laughs> Go out, make the road. Come on. Um, under Sarah's leadership, Make the Road uh, Action in New Jersey has quickly established itself as a key political player in the state, leading strategic voter mobilization efforts in state and federal races. For the general election, her team completed 140,000 calls and text messages to voters in key house districts, helping to ensure the re-election of vulnerable Democrats. Previously, Sarah was a staff attorney and Equal Justice Works fellow at Make the Road New York. She is a commissioner on the New Jersey Census Complete Count Commission and was co-chair of Governor-elect Phil Murphy's Transition Team's Law and Justice Committee. So give it up for our panelists. <laughs> and briefly, just give it, up, give it up for yourselves because both in terms of how these books get made and, and how our movement really moves, it's, it's by each of us coming together collectively in our power. Um, so thank you so much for being here today and I'll pass it off to Lindsay to start our event. Thank you, Jay. And thank you everybody for coming out. Um, as Jay mentioned, my name is Lindsay Zafir and I'm one of the editors of Power Lines. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here tonight moderating this panel. Um, this book started as a project of The Forge, uh, which is a journal by and for organizers across the progressive movement, where I used to work as the editor. Uh, I had wanted to do something, I think it was late 2022, and I had wanted to do something on climate in 2023. Um, and so I started calling every organizer around the country who I knew who worked on climate to ask them 
what would be a really useful contribution that the forge could make to the conversation about uh, strategies for uh, combating climate change. And um, a couple of things came up really consistently. One was the importance of thinking really deeply about how to build alignment between the labor and the climate movements. Um, that in order to win a just transition from fossil fuels, we really needed to knit labor and climate together. And another, and this was especially true for local organizers working on the ground, felt like they knew about national organizations and the big greens, but they didn't actually have a lot of spaces where they could connect with other local organizers working in other places across the country on climate and labor issues. And so wanting to kind of have some of that um, scaffolding and connective tissue built. Um, so when an editor from the New Press reached out about they were interested in doing more work on organizing and partnering with The Forge on that, um, I called Jeff to see if he would conspire with me to pull together an anthology that could meet both of these needs. So helping to kind of tie together more tightly labor and climate justice movements and to really lift up the amazing work that's already happening across the country um, that bring these two movements together and to pull out the lessons learned, um, to pull out innovative models and strategies and to help to start to tie together what was happening locally around the country. Um, <clears throat> so Jeff came, came along and helped to really pull the book together. Um, Jeff is, the as, the, as he said, the North American director of 350.org. At the time, he was working at Green Workers Alliance, which is a really amazing organization that um, organizes workers in renewable energy fields. And we have a um, contribution from the director of Green Workers in here. And Jeff, along with Mia Yoshitani, who's at a climate justice organization called APEN in Northern California, um, and Sh Chantel Bingham from Climate Justice Alliance really, really pulled this together and brought in all of these amazing organizers uh, to tell their stories. And this is really a book of what we call in the introduction, Spark Stories, that we hope will spark um, a bigger movement over time. So. Uh, I want to start by kicking it off with Jeff to tell us a little more um, about the book. Uh, so why this book um, and why right now? Oh, I, oh, I, I have my own microphone. Um, <laughs> good evening and um, especially glad and grateful to be here with, with <clears throat> Buenas Noches con Make the Road para celebrar su victoria contra Amazon y también he escuchado que han ganado contra uh, que se quedan los impuestos también contra lo, las ingresas grandes en Nueva Jersey. Entonces, felicidades. I'm just saying, I'm really, really excited to be here and celebrate with Make the Road. Um, they are just brilliant work, not just beating Amazon, but also holding the line and keeping the corporate tax on the most powerful corporations. So just, yeah, I think this is like a celebration of, of people power. Um, and I think really, Lindsay, the way you talked about it, like why, why we had the book is, to celebrate so much brilliant organizing that's happening that we don't, we don't really know about. And that is not just happening, but is also happening that's pretty, pretty nuanced. Um, and that I think sometimes, maybe I'll, I'll start and, and tell a couple anecdotes over the last decade about why we sometimes make it too simple about climate and labor. That climate says this or labor says this. Um, I helped start an organization in Missouri that was a, a, a successor to ACORN in St. Louis. And we were fighting Peabody Coal was our first campaign. And it was the most powerful, uh, the largest coal company, largest private coal company in the world and the most powerful corporation in the city of St. Louis. And so we needed to fight, fight them because they were, they really influenced the way the city of St. Louis moved. And as the organization was starting, they were trying to get a tax break on $60 million of office renovations, which would have taken money from the schools and, and everything else. And, you know, people said, oh, well, they're, they were a, a union company. So lots of the mine workers supported them. But you know what? In fighting those tax breaks, we went to the teachers union, we went to the operating engineers who stood with us and going, going to city council and trying to stop those tax breaks. And this was about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, and the second thing that happened was I was reminded about a year after Hurricane Sandy hit New York, we were meeting with a senior person from the AFL-CIO and they said, you know, about just transition and again, we think labor is a monolith and thinks a certain way. 
And that person said, you know, after Sandy, there were huge fights among rank and file workers in the building trades. So the construction trades, the ones we think, oh, they'll, they're building the pipelines, they're building everything, everything, because they were so directly affected, right? Their houses were flooded, they, they were displaced, just like everyone, so many other people in New York. And I think for the last decade, I've been thinking, we make things too simplistic. We think there's climate, and they're, they think, all think one way, and there's labor, and they all think a different way. And really, things are much more nuanced, things are much more complicated. And the reason to do an anthology was because while there's no right answer, it's really important for us when we're thinking about who's organizing in the climate space, who's organizing in the labor space, to know that there's differences among the unions, they don't all speak in a unified way, and there's differences even within unions for, you know, between workers and their leadership sometimes, and these are democratic organizations. So that's why we wanted to tell some of the stories, and the reason for it to be an anthology is because we don't have one right pathway or one right answer to this. There's stories of, you know, different campaigns, and we can learn from them. And then I think the question of right now is both we all know the urgency of the moment, but also the opportunity. We've now got a climate movement that continues. For folks who live in New York, there were 75,000 people in the streets in September. Um, for folks who are thinking about labor, we have now many more fighting labor organizations, right? You've just seen the victories from the Starbucks workers and the auto workers. And the auto workers, their win in the contracts was not just about um, winning better wages and working conditions for auto workers, it was also about their ability to organize the future of automaking, to organize in the battery plants, to organize electric vehicles. That was another win and that's the kind of organizing they're doing next. So it, now is the time and we need to really all go in in fighting as hard as we can on climate, fighting as hard as we can for workers. Both our backs are to the wall, and this is a tremendous time of opportunity, and so I think this book is like, especially at a, a, a relevant time. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, this is a book of stories uh, from the organizers on the ground who are doing the work. So before talking a little bit more with you, Jeff, about the book as a whole, I wanna pass it to Winifred and Sarah um, to tell their story of building a labor climate coalition on the ground that could defeat Amazon. Um, and I think, think you all are gonna read a bit, right? Okay, well, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, we can read. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, bueno. Buenas noches, compañeros y compañeras. Yo también puedo hablar español. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Winifred Victor Hines. And um, <clears throat> currently, I live in uh, Newark, New Jersey, like uh, Jay said, and the executive director of uh, We Quick Park Association. Now, We Quick Park Association <clears throat> really doesn't have too much to do with um, labor. And so I came into this world of organizing when I joined Marinol when um, I lived in Latin America. I went to work there with Marinol in, uh, in Venezuela. And so I started grassroots organizing and canvassing. And um, I lived in a really poor neighborhood, um, a red zone, where people didn't have, you know, a lot of resources and uh, the, a lot of the houses were makeshift homes. And a lot of my neighbors were people who labored, you know, all over the place, were maids, who, were, who worked in hotels, who worked in uh, construction, um, some of them who begged on the streets. And um, so I got to know them in, on a different level. And that completely changed my outlook. And so it instilled in me this passion um, to even go out and make this world an even more just place. And, and so um, when I returned to the United States and um, worked in um, DC and other places, and uh, somehow my husband who's over there and I, we winded up in Newark. And uh, I 
started to go to Weequick Park, and then I started working at Weequick Park. And then lo and behold, um, one day, Sarah um, sent me an email, or maybe it was Amy Goldsmith, another wonderful organizer with Clean Water Action, um, who should also be in um, this book, who I, I believe you were mentioned. And so I started to meet all these wonderful people, and um, I was introduced to Make the Road New York and Make the Road New Jersey, and then we started to plan all of this. And, um, and it was wonderful because it reminded me of the type of organizing that I was accustomed to in Latin America. And um, here, my experience wasn't as positive and as enriching as what I had experienced in Latin America in terms of the solidarity, in terms of people looking out for each other, and in terms of, I guess, the skin in the game. Because when you are organizing, when you are striking, it, it's about your life. It is, it, your life really is on the balance because it's, it's what you are, right? So you don't have, in, in terms of um, the luxury, you know, like some, you know, some other people do who organize, like you can leave it behind. You know, you can leave it behind and switch over and there you are, you wear your organizer hat and then you wear your other hat where you may be, you know, um, in bed with the oppressors at times. And so, you know, it just, you know, fulfilled me um, so much that I was, um, I guess, committed. Like, I hadn't been in a really long time. And um, <clears throat> so I have um, Make the Road New Jersey to thank for it and also uh, Clean Water Action with Amy, who, um, <clears throat> you know, who you know, sent me the emails and sent me the information so that I could actually go and participate in this. So um, I will stop there, and then Sarah can continue. Yeah, thank you so much, Winnie, um, and thank you, Lindsay and Jeff and Jay. This is a really, really exciting event, and it's so great to be here with so many friends. And compañeros, gracias, compas, por unirse de Fasek, de ese Camino. And thank you, Nedia Marcy, who's our Director of Strategic Projects, also interpreting today. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to share a little bit more on the story of how, you know, which we talk about in the book, and you should all get the book and read it, and there's so many inspiring stories. Um, but sort of this, you know, labor community and environmental justice coalition that we all built together in New Jersey to fight back against Amazon. Um, so in August of 2021, um, there were some frantic emails and texts that went around. Ryan from Athena was on the chain and Amy and Winnie and um, a few others when we found out that um, the Port Authority of New Jersey had entered into this secret deal with Amazon to launch a massive air hub at the Newark airport. Um, and the, play, the air hub would um, mean that there would be hundreds of new flights, packages, trucks coming in and out of the airport. And the Newark airport, as many of you know, is located in Newark and in Elizabeth in environmentally um, already overburdened communities. Um, so Make the Road New Jersey, where I work, we're a grassroots membership-based organization of immigrant and working class people. Based, and Elizabeth is one of our centers. Um, we We'd been organizing around Amazon. Um, you know, our members are logistics workers. They work in temp agencies and also for Amazon and um, for warehouses. Um, and we'd been hearing about the problems in the warehouses for a long time. Um, we also um, were deeply concerned about the environmental impacts and also the way that Amazon had been working to provide infrastructure and technology to ICE. So there was already sort of efforts afoot, um, both from environmental justice organizations like um, the South Ward Environmental Environmental Alliance, We Quick Park Alliance, um, Association rather, and um, Cl Clean Water Action to fight back against some of Amazon's, um, uh, you know, problematic um, practices and their and their really dangerous monopoly that was 
sort of taking over New Jersey. Um, and then we find out that there's this air hub coming. Um, so the Port Authority didn't have any public hearings. They didn't take comment. Um, they didn't really consult with the community that would be impacted before they entered into this deal. And it would have created this massive air hub um, that would really cement Amazon's presence on the East Coast and in New Jersey. Uh, during the pandemic, Amazon became the largest employer in New Jersey, um, the largest public sector employer private sector, excuse me, employer in New Jersey. And it also expanded its footprint. It doubled in size across the state. So there were warehouses cropping up everywhere, delivery stations, um, and most were located in already um, overburdened communities. So we knew we had to fight, and then we sort of had to figure out how we were going to do it together. Um, so uh, we pulled together a coalition. We met at the um, ripe hour of 9 a.m. on Monday mornings. <laughs> So you know if you're in it, you're in it, um, if your coalition can stick it through on a Monday morning, 9 a.m. weekly conference call. Um, and we really built out a community labor and environmental coalition that started to fight back. And I think we had sort of three areas where we were able, and we can, uh, there's some really nice pictures too, so we can also so sh show some slides while I'm talking. But basically, you know, we... Um, we brought together, we called ourselves Good Jobs Clean Air New Jersey. We thought we had two months to fight back against the Air Hub. They were supposed to sort of sign the deal within two months of announcing it. And so we pulled together this coalition. We had a, launch, a press conference that launched in Weequick Park which, you know, is where Winnie's organization is based. It's the lungs of Newark. It's in the South Ward across the street from the airport. The, air, the airplanes fly over. Um, and it's really the green space in this um, neighborhood where the child asthma rates are higher than almost any other place in the country. Um, so we launched here bringing together labor unions, grassroots organizations that represented the community um, and environmental justice and environmental groups. Um, and we started to hammer really hard. We started canvassing. We started um, building out uh, research that would show how Amazon was impacting workers and communities across our state. In New Jersey, there was sort of this sense that, you know, oh, you know, Amazon is sort of bad, but maybe we need the jobs. Maybe they pay a little bit better. You know, the mayor of Newark and his, you know, his some folks associated with him sent a valentine to Amazon after they turned down the HQ2 in, in New York, after the amazing campaign defeated HQ2 in New York. Um, so there was this sort of effort to bring Amazon to Newark. Um, and so we really had to counteract that. And we did that by building this coalition. We knocked on hundreds of doors, collected thousands of petitions, um, attended every single Port Authority meeting, making noise, disrupting the meeting, testifying, bringing community members um, to the Port Authority um, to really you know, speak out against this deal. We spoke, um, we collected research that showed that Amazon um, jobs were actually hurting community members. Um, we had to really fight back against the propaganda from Amazon that was sort of saying that it was a good corporation and, and good for workers. And there's probably more nice pictures here if you want to keep going through. Next slide and the next. Um, and I think, and, you know, did a lot of work in the press and began to build political support. So we were able to pull elected officials on our side um, to start to speak out against um, the, the um, proposed deal um, and, and continued. And we were starting to hear that there wasn't a, you know, it was, supposed to, it was two months, then three months, then four months, then six months, then 10 months, um, and that we, that we continued, continued to really hammer home. Um, and I think what finally, you know, helped us sort of defeat this air hub was having intense community pressure that lasted months and months and months that we were really pushing in every, um, every hearing, um, collecting signatures, delivering thousands of petitions, putting out research. Every, like before every um, Port Authority hearing, we'd put out a new sort of research that showed some of the problems with Amazon in the community. Um, and then also ALU had this incredible win in April of 2022. Um, they won the first Amazon labor union at the Staten Island JFK 8 Warehouse Fulfillment Center. Um, yes. Um, and that really helped us um, really drive home. And at that point, um, we were able to get our members of Congress, the governor, and others to, to speak out against the deal. And that really ended, um, ended uh, the, the proposed deal on Amazon and, um, and uh, the Port Authority parted their ways. Um, and I'll, I think, I mean, well, I, I'll stop there. I think there's, there's some more photos also of some of the work in, that 
that may be helpful to see. Yeah, this is some of the research, the rallies. We have a little video. You can do it later, yeah. yeah we, we can, can keep it. it. Do you want to keep? Yeah. You want to do it? Okay. Yeah, we can show the video. Yes, play it. Play it. <laughs> On this Amazon Prime Day, workers and environmental groups in New Jersey are demanding better air quality outside an Amazon warehouse in Elizabethtown. Esto es horrible y es un ejemplo de que Amazon no tiene la capacidad para producir la calidad que necesitamos. New Jersey impactó económicamente la mediana y la pequeña empresa. My name is Yamila Suarez. I'm an Elizabeth re resident um, uh, and I'm a member of Make the Road New Jersey. I'm here today because I'm worried about the deal with uh, Amazon and the Port Authority. I was a delivery driver. I've uh, ridden all over the state of New Jersey and I can tell you the impact that Amazon has had in New Jersey with uh, small to medium sized companies. <laughs> A controversial plan to build an Amazon cargo hub at Newark Airport has officially been scrapped. I am a fourth generation Norker. I am the parent of three asthmatic children. The port of New York and New Jersey is my backyard. 25,000 trucks traveling in and out of that port. 4,500 stand on our local roads. We cannot stand any more pollution in our communities because our lives do matter. After nearly a year of protests by activists who argue the facility would put more of an environmental burden on communities of color that are already over polluted. But nearby communities push back, saying that if Amazon wants to come into the neighborhood, they need to create and guarantee jobs, clean air, and fair labor policies. We reached out to Amazon for comments on all this. So far, we haven't heard back. Thank you um, for sharing so much about the amazing campaign and that amazing video. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about some of the challenges in building this kind of labor community coalition and how you navigated them. Well, um, for me, being a small nonprofit, because we're grassroots, bare bones, um, I don't even receive a salary. So um, we depend a lot on volunteers. So, but um, the one thing that we did have was um, a space where we could meet sometimes. And then also the park, a space where we can go and talk directly to people. And um, so speaking for um, my organization, that was mostly um, the challenge and then also getting people interested. And like um, <clears throat> Sarah mentioned, whenever I would speak to someone and talk to them about Amazon, they always said, well, you know, what about the jobs? Because it's um, an impoverished community, overburdened, um, to give you an idea, Newark is surrounded by the airport, the port, and then also, you know, the trucks. By Freeling Housing, where the park is, their last county was like 5,000 trucks a day pass by there. And so people are tired, you know, because it's always something. So you have the waste incinerators, you have um, all sorts of other pollution, you have lead in the water. So trying to get people excited about Amazon, that, you know, for us was the challenge because it was a waste job. We need jobs, you know, we have a high unemployment rate and um, housing, we have housing issues. Rent is rising. We have a whole bunch of health issues, you know, not too much health insurance. So just to get people excited, I would say, was our biggest challenge. And, and to get people to really show up to some of the meetings, 
um, that was uh, another challenge. And also to get people to trust the organization because organizations come and go in our neighborhood. And, and so you think, oh, all right, so you're going to use us for this fight, but once it's over, what's going to happen? And how can we ensure that you're even going to win because Amazon is so huge? You know, you can't beat Amazon. So what, you know, how are you going to do it? And what are we going to get out of it also finally? So I would say those were the biggest challenges. And how did, how did you do it? How did you get people excited and believing it was possible? Well, just, um, you know, keep trying, basically. Keep talking to them. And I think when, um, whenever, when we started to win, when um, the other um, labor organizations started to win, and then they started to see that it was possible, oh, okay, well, maybe it can happen. And um, so even after Amazon was defeated and, um, you know, it came out in the paper that they were um, backing out of the deal, people were still a bit skeptical. They were like, okay, what's going on? Is this really happening? But as time went on and then we had the celebration and then it started to show up more in the news, all of a sudden, you know, I, I, you know, I would say it gave us a boost of confidence that, yeah, we can do it. Because the last win that we had had was um, with the Newark Water Group a long time ago when um, Senator Cory Booker, who was the mayor, wanted to privatize the water. And nobody thought we could do it. And we stopped him from privatizing the water. And so it, it had been a long time. And then, you know, one thing after another, and it seemed as if things were getting worse. And um, so it, it was a bit incredulous that um, we actually did it and that um, we beat Amazon. You know, so. And I think it was also, uh, let me add one more thing. And um, because of the coalition of so many different organizations who came together, and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, it was a bit of a pain. You know, the nine o'clock meetings, <laughs> you know, on Mondays. It was a bit of a pain, and then sometimes some people not showing up and um, having to meet with some of, uh, of the politicians, you know, all these other things, and, and it's not easy doing canvassing. You know, a lot of these folks here, you know, deserve a lot of credit for what they did, um, you know, because it was labor intensive, and people don't take that into consideration because they have other things to do also and taking the time out of their lives to do this. I mean, that's, that says a lot. And I think, you know, I think there's also, just to the point of the coalition, like it was rare, I think, to b bring together um, labor unions, like RWDSU, the Teamsters, uh, Workers United, labor unions that were representing, you know, uh, workers in the logistics sector, um, and also environmental justice groups and community organizations. It's happened sometimes, but it wasn't like this. Was, I, I never had gotten the opportunity to meet Winnie before, or get to work with Amy. So this is like a new coalition for us. Um, and I think it took time to build trust and to figure out how we were going to work together. One exercise we did in the beginning was to really come up with the demands that we had of Amazon and to really say that we were going to stick to each other's demands. We weren't going to let Amazon greenwash the deal by electing electrifying their fleet or whatever else they promised that they might do. We weren't going to let, um, you know, winning a, a union contract, um, although I don't think Amazon would ever agree to that, you know, like we weren't going to say, okay, if they, you know, the, the Port Authority kept saying, oh, but they'll get health care, it'll be fine, um, sort of really making sure that we were lifting up each other's demands. And there was a moment, I'm going to just, because if this is a book reading, I'm going to read from the book because it's going to say it better than I will. Um, but basically, um, like we, we came up with those demands, but it was, and, and sort of agreed to to lift them up, but it was really the moment of sort of bringing our members together and realizing that the, you know, Teamsters members were living in the South Ward, breathing the same air as the folks, you know, they were going to have this Amazon facility in their neighborhood. Um, they were fighting, you know, the jobs they had were jobs they wanted to protect. Their, their kids were working at Amazon. They sort of saw the difference. So I'll just, I'll read a tiny portion, I promise, tiny. 
um, that I think illustrates that. Um, so this is around the camp. So we launched this canvas that we would do from uh, Winnie's organization at the Wee Quake Park, uh, in, in the Wee Quake Park. Um, and here's a little tidbit about that. One of the volunteers for the community canvas was Teamsters member Tyrone Gilliam. His daughter had worked for Amazon and had experienced unsafe working conditions while she was pregnant. He saw the sharp difference between his daughter's non-union Amazon job and his union position. He also lived in Elizabeth, close to where the Air Hub would be built. Tyrone's story was not unique. As the Canvas training began, each community and union member shared stories like Tyrone, stories about unemployment or stories about employment related injuries, have their kids having asthma or the lack of quality work as the corporation came to dominate the labor market. And it became harder to see division between the environmental justice organizations and the labor unions. Everyone was affected by Amazon, and many were affected in multiple ways, as a worker or a future worker, as a member of the community, or as a parent of a child breathing polluted air. A union contract wouldn't solve the problems of pollution or increase tra traffic that workers living in nearby neighborhoods would face, and a commitment to clean energy at the Air Hub wouldn't fix the backbreaking injuries. Everyone was going to bear the brunt of the Air Hub, and we all had to fight it together. And I think that was really sort of the moment that really solidified the work for us is realizing that, you know, Amazon was the largest employer. We were all going to have to face it in some way, shape, or form, and we had to fight this air hub to show Amazon that they couldn't come into New Jersey and take over and, you know, drive down the job standards and create more pollution in our communities, and that, I think, really helped us bring, bring the coalition together. It's one of the things that comes out really strongly in your piece in particular, but also throughout the anthology is, um, you know, there's this kind of false division between labor and climate. But when you get down to the level of members that, you know, workers are community members and community members are also workers. And so there's a lot of rich opportunity to bring people together around their common interests. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about what, what's come out of, like after you won, what's come out of the coalition and what you see as um, opportunities right now or in the future for more labor climate collaboration in New Jersey? Yeah, I mean, lots. I think, you know, first of all, like building this coalition together, taking on this campaign that none of us had planned for. This wasn't like, oh, let's plan for five years and then fight Amazon. It was really like, here's, you know, we'd all been doing work around fighting Amazon and then this air hub landed in our backyard. And so it was really an opportunity to build relationships and then continue them. Um, so we were able to continue the work of um, this coalition in terms of fighting for um workplace protections and community protections in a climate um, emergency and climate crisis. Um, so right now we're working on a whole new agenda um, with the same organizations to one, build out protections for workers, for Amazon workers and others who are facing climate emergencies. So say, for example, you're working in a warehouse and there's a flood or a forest fire and there's smoke in the air and you can't, you know, you can't get to work or you can't get home, um, having protections in the job there. Um, and then also f figuring out ways that we can continue to fight warehouses um, and their growth in New Jersey and make sure that they're, that the way that they're building warehouses in New Jersey is a way that protects workers and protects the environment. Um, and so the sort of bringing together those um, concerns and having continued dialogue has really helped us to continue, continue growing. We're also, we got to hire two new Amazon worker organizers in New Jersey, and there's some really exciting um, work that they've been doing, and a lot will be popping off really soon, um, so please follow, continue to follow us um, on social media, and, um, and there's going to be a lot more exciting um, sort of action happening there. Um, we really see the work around Amazon as a way to bring together so many um, partners and to really take on this, you know, massive, dangerous monopoly and build community power to fight back. Well, um, since I'm not really an um, organizer in, in terms of um, the same way that um, Sarah is, um, mine is more in terms of um, nature-based solutions in a uh, park, but um, I, I do see um, future collaborations, and I do see the need for it. And um, one thing that uh, came out of this uh, coalition was um, thanks to a, a grant 
I mean, it wasn't a huge grant or anything like that, but it was super helpful that uh, Athena and Make the Road New, um, New Jersey gave to the Weequick Park Association. So we were able to participate even more than, um, it, than if we hadn't received um, that grant. And because of that grant, we were able to procure other grants. And, and so um, about last year, due to that small grant, we got close to about a million dollars in grants because of um, Make the Road New Jersey. So um, all these things help in terms of organizing, getting people together, and building the movement, making it even stronger. Uh, and also to show people that it is possible that these two um, different worlds can come together, even though they seem to be uh, separate. You know, like you said, they really are the same. And um, so I look forward to the different ways, the creative ways that we can collaborate and how Weequick Park Association and in other organizations like Weequick Park can also um, participate in, in the labor movement and also bring their own spin, you know, and creativity to, to that movement as well. What are some of the key lessons that you're taking with you from this fight? I mean, I think it's, it comes back to, like, how, how do you build a coalition that can really work together, that can move together, um, and that can really lift up each other's um, issues and concerns and see the common ground. And I think um, that, you know, continuing to build out our work in that way to continue to take on fights that may seem insurmountable and may seem impossible, um, but to really continue pushing as hard as we can and um, to be relentless in, in those fights and to really center community organizing and power um, is, you know, the key lesson for us. And I think, um, you know, we're seeing now, you know, like, for example, we just, you know, with many partners in New Jersey, won a campaign to, or we're winning a campaign to continue a corporate business tax. And, you know, a couple of years ago, if you would have said Amazon is, you know, too big and, and, um, and is a bad employer and is, you know, problematic and needs to, needs to go, um, you know, I think a lot of people in New Jersey would have had an issue with that. And now we were able to win this campaign on this tax or, or winning this campaign on tax, it's not totally done yet, um, uh, that would tax Amazon because we've really been able to shift the narrative and shift the um, assessment of Amazon in, in New Jersey so that most of the public is really turned against it. And I think that's really the power of bringing together so many um, different, um, you know, organizations, stakeholders, people with different interests um, from climate and, and, um, and environmental justice and um, community and labor to really um, build power to take on, to take on Amazon. And uh, pretty much the same in, in terms of um, um, building the coalition, but also that the public needs to hear these kinds of stories. Um, they need to hear what um, the workers are going through. And uh, I also was surprised when um, I first um, started with the, the coalition, how many people that I knew had at one point worked for Amazon, and I hadn't realized it. Like Sonia, right here, sitting right, she worked for for Amazon for three days. For three, <laughs> <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> three days. So you see, so so many people that I I had no idea who worked for Amazon, and uh, I remember. Okay, <laughs> oh probably a, a lot of people probably wouldn't have. But um, I remember at uh, one point when we were um, meeting with um, some of the candidates, and it, it's good when it's an election period also, uh, because they tend to listen to you a lot more because they want your vote. And I remember a meeting that we had with um, Robert Menendez Jr., and um, it was a Naomi who told her story. And um, I remember as I was listening to her story and what she had to go through, and, um, and her story I think is, is in the book also, 
and uh, having to call the ambulance and she couldn't afford it and then she had to. And talking to Menendez Jr., asking him what he's going to do about it, I got choked up, you know, and, you know, tears came up. And, and so I think a lot of people don't realize, they have no clue what it is um, that, um, you know, these wonderful folks go through. And, and some people, you know, they just don't care. I remember one time when I was in graduate school and we were talking about climate change and in terms of growing local. And uh, one of my classmates said, if I want my bananas in the winter, I don't care, you know? I want my bananas in the winter, so I don't care what happens, climate change or no climate. You know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, no clue. The cognitive dissonance, I mean, it's, it, it's real. And um, so, you know, definitely that it should come out more, the stories, and, and, and we should educate a lot of people about what really goes on and that, um, you know, somehow find the way, whether it's the press or another way, to get these stories out there and make policies, you know, that could change this. Um, you mentioned a corporate tax campaign. Are there other issues that um, are really live for your members right now? I mean, so at Make the Road, we're working on a whole host of different campaigns um, on housing. That's a major crisis that many of our members are facing, working to make sure that we have um, rent control and access to green social housing in our cities and across our state. Um, we're also working to continue organizing um, workers in the logistics sector, whether it's temp workers, Amazon drivers, um, building out protections in the workplace when there's a climate emergency. And we're also really excited to continue our work on immigrant rights and fighting for um, broader protections at the federal and state level. Um, so there's a lot more that, um, that we'll be continuing to work on. And I think, um, you know, I've, be being able to work so closely with organizations like Clean Water Action and Weequake Park and um, Southward Environmental Alliance have really just helped us to build out um, how, you know, how we take on campaigns and how we, how we fight and how we organize in New Jersey. Well, thank you both for sharing that. Um, I hope folks get a chance to read um, to read your essay in this and then also to follow your work more broadly. Um, I'm going to ask one more question to Jeff, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So if folks are starting to think of questions, um, get them ready. But Jeff, I, just stepping back to look at the whole anthology, um, I'm wondering what you hope people will take away from it. Yeah, a few things. Well, first of all, I think organizers... Um, and those involved in fights need to be writing a lot more um, because I think there's so much to learn and we all need editors like Lindsay who will both like the patience that people had to sort of dig in and write one, two, three, four, I don't know, seven drafts sometimes and Lindsay constantly being like, what's your argument here though? Like what, what's your thesis? Um, and both leaning into the story and with the learnings. Um, but I think we're just like, so many of these stories we're not telling and it really having the pleasure to both help not just wrangle people to write, but also to sort of watch Lindsay and help try to make people make their, their points so that we could learn from them. And then I think, you know, this room, looking at this room, some people are organizers, some people aren't. Um, but it's good to remember, like, just some basic lessons. And Lindsay, you said this, you know, that if you put people in a room together, they will, like, our humanity will come through, we will understand what we're up against and we will figure it out together. And I think sometimes we're, you know, a little bit afraid to do that, or there's organizers who think, you know, we're super professionals and we know the answers and we can make the campaign plan. And really it's about many of the people in this room figuring things out, talking to each other and moving forward and making some mistakes and learning some things. And so I think that process is so important. And I think that also demystifies it. Like there's not a world of organizers and non-organizers. It's something that anyone can do. We can all get together with people and think about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to win, and do that. So I think that's like the first lesson. And then related to that, I think, is we also have to be willing to 
really have some struggle and some conflict. And not just conflict, some of it's conflict with you know, the, one of the largest corporations in the world and the boss. But some of it's also conflict with each other. Um, I'm reminded, like there are a couple things that really felt sharp in the book. If you read Veronica Coptis' piece, who was the head of the Center for Coalfield Justice, they really put themselves out there, right? So they, they were fighting long wall mining in Pennsylvania, and they said on social media, they said, you can, if you're a miner, and then, and then the, the, the mining company said, oh no, we're gonna, we're gonna have to stop mining because those pesky environmentalists are in the way. And the, that team at the Center for Coalfield Justice said, you know what, if you wanna know the real story about the mines and the permit, give us a call. And they sat in their office and they took calls and they met with the miners who were like, well, you're against what we're trying to do and against our livelihoods. And they said, yeah, but we're, going, we're actually going to tell you what's really happening with the mining company, with your boss. We know what's going on. We know what's going on with the permits. But just being willing to step into that level of conflict created the credibility that they needed to be able to have that fight. And I think there's so many within this book, there are so many other stories like that. Uh, the Green Workers Alliance, people having conversations about masking and safety and vaccinations and like all the complexity around that given the workforce and the variety of viewpoints and being willing to struggle with each other about that. So I think that's really important is both in order we have to sharpen the muscles to be able to have conflict with each other if we're going to take on the most powerful corporations in the world that are destroying the planet and that are making people work two, three, four jobs, right? And, and I think that's like really important in, in many of the pieces. And then I think the, the third thing is um, just thinking about the vision of where we want to go. And I think what's remarkable is as workers have organized, it's also taken them, you know, we've heard from, from you all what your next steps are in creating more green space, creating better communities, to watch farm workers be like, actually, we want to grow differently. We want to control land and we want to create more native crops and it's about a larger um, relationship with the planet. And so I think the vision happens, like people really see themselves as being part of this longer term vision. Um, and I really like that, um, you know, that Winona and Ashley's piece is in here too that talks about sort of a fundamental critique of the way our economic system works, of capitalism. There's like pieces both small and large of where we're trying to go in the society that we need to build if we're both going to have the leisure and the security that we need as well as the planet that we need. So I feel like those are the main um, learnings for me and they're like they come out in little ways and big ways in each of the pieces. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think we have maybe 15 minutes for Q&A, so we have time for a few questions, if anyone has them. Yeah? Oh, should I like, pass the mic, right? Oh, you run mic run. I'm a runner. I'm okay, a runner. great. You can sit. <laughs> Hello. Thank you guys for your such a remarkable expertise and experience that you're sharing with us tonight. I, my mind is blown, but I, I am so curious to hear more about how we fund the reparative frameworks or the reparative approaches that organizations take to building community development. I know Winnie, you mentioned that you secured grants that have allowed your organization to be more engaged in the movement. And I also think about the work that's being done on the Amazon corporate tax. And I wonder if there's an angle to ensure that the tax funds social programs or funds labor organizing or anything in that regard, um, in part because as I work to organize communities that I come from, I see one of the biggest things is that they don't feel like they'll get anything back from their engagement. And so trying to show them that like the burden, we can place the financial burden on corporations to repair our communities. And I mean, that's not the only way that we repair, but I think there's, there's a way to leverage that. And I'd love to hear if that's 
something that the, your organizations are working towards or if there's an appetite for that in the local New Jersey, New York landscape? That others should answer, but that's a great, I mean, a great point. And I think, you know, that was really central to our campaign in New Jersey to win and reestablish this corporate tax was to talk about how Amazon was getting a massive tax break, right? They're the, you know, one of the richest companies in the world, raking in record profits. They're getting a massive tax break. And at the same time, transit riders, people riding the bus and the trains in New Jersey were facing a 15% fare hike. And so really talking about how we need Amazon, you know, Amazon must stop hoarding its wealth. It has to pay its fair share in taxes so that we can have a, a functioning transit system and really tying together like why it is that we tax these corporations and what we need it for in, in the community. And yeah, I love, yes, let's tax Amazon to fund organizing. Hey. Yeah, yeah. We need to put pressure on our um, public representatives also, um, because people really are tired and sick and tired of all the you know low corporate taxes, and um, you feel like it's such a burden every day because taxes increase housing, and then they keep putting the money that it's tax money to other things, like um, Sarah mentioned, the 15% fare hike. And then also now they are trying to expand, there's this New Jersey Turnpike expansion that they are doing instead of investing in the public transit. So all these things, we have to put pressure on our public representatives over and over again because they are the key. And we just have to vote them out. You know, just vote them out. Doesn't matter if they are there for one day. Vote them out because a lot of them are useless, seriously. You know, so that's what we have to do if we want to see these things implemented. So thank you so much for the presentation. Buenas todos, muchas gracias también por estar aquí. Um, relating to your, so just to present myself, I'm the legislative director for Assemblymember Tapia. I'm not here for anything like this. Um, but regarding that, there is a bill for that, not by our, our office, but the Climate Change Superfund Act. It's sponsored by a bunch of people in the assembly. Um, it passed the Senate just this session, and it still has to be passed in the assembly. So everybody put pressure on us to pass that, Climate Change Superfund Act. Um, but I wanted to ask because the, uh, the assembly district that I work for is one of the poorest, it, it is the poorest district in, the, in New York State. It is also, you know, it's in the Bronx, so it's severely impa in, impacted by, of course, the Cross Bronx Expressway, you know, the asthma rates are crazy. So I definitely resonate with what you guys were saying about New Jersey. So I wanted to know when do you find, what do you find are the strategies to get communities that are living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, communities that are always um, worried about, you know, just making it day to day and being able to engage them in the broader talks of you know, the, climate, the, the climate change, the global, global warming, and of course labor and connecting those. And especially I also wanted to, it's kind of a double question, where, where, do, where are we most helpful elected officials? And when do, you, when do we have to like, you know, stop? Well, what is something that we do that is unhelpful? Because I want to know exactly what do you and do you not want from us as well? Okay, first question was how yeah, so basically, how do you get, how was it that you found, how did you um, successfully get people engaged that are like, you know, living paycheck to paycheck that are in a very precarious economic situation, especially also there's, you know, language barriers, so just that, people that are very marginalized and not engaged with as much um, and, you know, need to be engaged with, especially with, because it impacts them the most, but they don't, uh, they aren't being, you know, uh, made aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah can probably speak more to that here, um, but from my experience in the past, it's um, in terms of relationship. You build relationship with them. Um, you go to their functions, you talk to them, um, you know, they become your friends, your family, and you have to treat them with respect you have to trust that they know what they are doing, what they are talking about. And if they don't, don't talk down to them. 
um, you know, just enlist their strengths and their talent, you know, speak to that. And um, once you have that relationship, you know, and that trust, then it becomes easier. But of course here, it's, it's also very hard you know, um, the cost of living, working. I mean, people work long hours in terms of commute, you know, child care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where funding comes in, where you, you can provide some of, some of um, um, those items, like cha um, daycare. If there's a way that when um, they go to a meeting, that you can have somebody to watch the children or put them someplace. That was, you know, my experience. We had to provide some of that in and also some food, et cetera. Um, but, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to do it, but it, it really is challenging. And, um, you know, but Sarah can probably speak to, to the ones here um, right now because I haven't done that in a really long time. The only, um, in, in terms of engagement, what I do is around the park, mostly. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think the core is really listening and um, building space for people to come up with the issues and campaigns they want to take on and um, figuring out together how to, how to build a campaign and how to fight. And um, yeah, that's the core of it. That's the essence. You had a second question. Yeah, right. when, like, when are we most helpful, I mean, elected officials most helpful, and when do we just back off? Are we doing, what is something that we do right? What is what we do right and what we do wrong? Or what you guys would like us to do more, basically? Um, in terms of uh, the community? In, yeah, in terms, sorry, in terms of create, of um, engaging with uh, like nonprofits and making sure that there is that coalition, you know, in terms of helping build coalitions, what is it that we do that is helpful? Where we, how can we contribute and how do we, should we not contribute? And oh, you as an organizer or? I, I guess, I know, me as a, as a staff. Oh, an you're an official, elected yeah. official. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, um, stop acting as if you know it all, right? that you know what's good <laughs> for, for the people and actually do what you say you're going to do and um, actually show up uh, when uh, we do invite you and uh, take time to, to listen to what the people are doing. And another thing, um, I don't think the officials are going to be happy about that, but I would like to see reports from officials you know, actually what it is that they are working on for, for instance, like if, if I'm a worker some, someplace in an office, right, and I'm left to my own device, I have to write a report, you know, if I go out into the field, whatever it is I do to show what it is that I've done, but somehow it escapes these officials. So to give reports to the public what it is that they're go what they're doing and then also where the money's going, et cetera, to be as transparent as, as possible. Um, and um, I, ge I guess, you know, to stop kowtowing to the corporations and the industrialists. You know, we're the ones, it's our taxpayer dollars. You know, we pay more in taxes than Amazon does. So you're supposed to be doing our bidding, not Amazon's or the other big corporations' bidding, basically. I'm gonna, we'll be around, so if any questions come up, feel free to just come up and chat with us. I'm gonna pass it to Jay to talk a little bit, what? Well, I think we have all, uh, yeah, I'll talk to people after, but I'm going to pass it to Jay to tell us how to, um, how to buy books. Yeah. Give it up for our panelists. <laughs> Woo! And please give it up for our Make the Road members who are here, who form that backbone. Um, yeah, so glad to see y'all tonight. David, could you put the last slide up um, for us? So tonight, I know that two things. I know that some of y'all 
um, reserved books. So if you reserved a book, please uh, talk to the folks at the front desk and give them your name and they'll have a copy of the book there ready for you to buy. If you did not reserve a book, copies will also be up there. Um, we may be a little short on physical copies between the people who reserve them and having extra copies. So what I've done here is put a QR code up for you to navigate over to 1804 Books, um, which Shirley mentioned, who is stocking the book. Uh, so please, if you'd like to buy the book, uh, and you find out that there aren't physical copies up there, please use this link if you're interested. There are so many stories um, to explore from coal country uh, to more countries. No, there's, there's, it's been a long day. Uh, there's, there's stories to explore from coal country to literally like my brain is doing that thing. Um, yeah, oh, farm workers, oil workers, ski lift, ski workers, ski resort workers. Um, so much to find out and so many campaigns to learn from. Uh, and so buy the book, check it out, um, and also mingle with each other, ask about the space, um, and form connections here because we know uh, it doesn't happen without us doing that as, as people together. Um, so one more round of applause for our panelists tonight. And thanks y'all for coming and thanks to the People's Forum for the space and I'll break there. <laughs>